you know, a, a year ago to this date, uh, if we examined, you know, what the mainstream media, what the pundits, what the uh, elected officials were telling us, um, Russia was on the verge of uh, initiating a unprovoked act of aggression against a uh, peaceful Ukrainian neighbor. Um, the West was trying everything possible to, uh, to prevent this conflict, uh, but was promising stringent economic sanctions against Russia that were designed to uh, deter Russia with the um, probability of economic collapse uh, should Russia invade. Um, and then once Russia did invade, we were told by the CIA, by General Mark Miley, by uh, analysts such as myself, that this war would be over in a week. Uh, that, that, and um, here we are a year later, and uh, everything I just told you was wrong. Uh, obviously, the war wasn't over in a week. It's, it's continuing, and the uh, death toll on both sides is uh, horrific. Uh, the damage that's been done to civilian infrastructure is unimaginable. Um, and the consequences of this war resonate far and wide. The economic sanctions that were promised, however, backfired. I mean, in a speech that uh, was delivered um, this morning, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin made it quite clear, clear that um, Russia was doing okay. Uh, their, their economy is doing all right, uh, more than all right. It's growing, it's expanding. Um, <clears throat> not only that, their defense industry it normally, when a country goes to war, um, they go into deficit spending. They, uh, uh, the economy, uh, the civilian economy pays a heavy price. Here we have Russia being uh, attacked by stringent sanctions. Uh, the 10th round coming out of Europe, the United States is issued multiple rounds. All these sanctions are designed to collapse the Russian economy, not to harm it, but to collapse it for the goal of regime change. We have a Harvard professor that has admitted this at Davos, the World Economic Forum. Um, where he said the purpose of sanctions is regime change, to collapse the Russian economy to such an extent that the Russian people rise up and remove Vladimir Putin from power. This hasn't worked. In fact, the, the harm for the sanctions are on those who have imposed the sanctions, especially those in Europe. Uh, Russia is doing okay. We were also told last year that Russia would be isolated, that the world would rally behind uh, the United States and its European allies. And today we find a situation that is uh, pretty much the exact opposite. Uh, many people are starting to question uh, what the goals and objectives of the United States and Europe are vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Ukraine. Um, while a lot of nations remain neutral um, or even um, opposed to the Russian actions in Ukraine, they did not jump on board the sanctions. And indeed, much of the rest of the world is heavily engaged in uh, economic and diplomatic activity with Russia. Uh, Africa, for instance, um, has uh, been at the forefront of uh, rejecting uh, these sanctions and, um, and if not supporting the Russian actions, at least saying that Russia is not their enemy because of these actions in Ukraine. And we can say the same for China, India, Indonesia, pretty much the entire world, except the United States, its European allies, Canada, maybe South Korea and Japan, Australia, uh, but everybody else, the majority of the world's population is either neutral or uh, sympathetic to, to Russia and, and becoming more sympathetic as it becomes clear that this war was not an unprovoked act of aggression. I mean, the, the benefit of a year's passage of time is some important things have come out. Uh, we now know that the Ukrainians, the Germans and the French, uh, all parties to the Minsk Accords, which were supposed to be a ceasefire arrangement negotiated in 2014, 2015 to bring it into this conflict, that this was a sham, a sham not by Russia, but by the West a sham that was designed to buy time so that NATO could build up a Ukrainian force that could carry out offensive operations against the Donbass, uh, targeting ethnic Russian um, Ukrainian uh, civilians. Um, so it appears that Russia's claims for preemptive collective self-defense under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter actually are cognizable uh, with fact, not speculation. Uh, it was the West that was the aggressor. Russia had no choice but defend itself by launching a preemptive strike. And this war continues. This war has gone beyond a Ukrainian-Russian conflict into a Russian conflict against the collective West, against NATO. Um, and the Ukrainian people are stuck in the middle. Um, and let there be no doubt, this is a war unlike any war that has been seen in modern times. Um, General Kabuli, the uh, commander of U.S. forces in Europe and the commander of all, all allied forces in Europe under NATO, 
recently said in a speech to um, Sweden that the scope and scale of the violence taking place in Ukraine is beyond imagination, that NATO is not prepared for this. Let me say that again. NATO can't fight this fight. NATO is incapable of fighting this fight. Um, they're not prepared. They're not tra trained. They're not equipped. Uh, they don't have the logistics. This war is beyond imagination. And that means people are dying in ways that we can't imagine. This, is, this isn't Iraq. This isn't Afghanistan. This isn't Syria. Those are horrible conflicts. I'm not trying to minimize the suffering, the serious suffering of people. But we don't have a clue here in the United States what's going on in Ukraine, the level of destruction, the level of death. And yet the United States and NATO continues to pour in billions of dollars of death dealing machinery to sustain this conflict, not for the victory of Ukraine. Ukraine will not win this war. We know that. Jan Stoltenberg, the Secretary General, has just come out and said, Ukraine will run out of artillery ammunition this summer, and there is no hope of replenishing them. And let me just tell you, as a military specialist, as somebody who spent a lot of time in the artillery, um, if you can't fire artillery shells, you will lose the battle, especially in a war that's defined largely by artillery. So Ukraine has lost. I'll say that one more time. Ukraine has lost this conflict. The question now is, what does that loss mean? How many more hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers have to die? How many tens of millions of Ukrainian civilians have to become displaced? How much more damage to the uh, security framework of Europe must, uh, must take place? What risks must be accrued by the entire global community because of this mad desire by the United States and NATO to use Ukraine as a proxy to bring harm to Russia? This gambit has failed. But let's just take a look again, uh, and I'll leave you with this. It is the speech given by Vladimir Putin today. One of the consequences of this failure is that Russia has withdrawn from the new strategic arms reduction treaty. There are no more, not withdrawn, suspended. I'm sorry, I'll be correct here. Uh, there are no more arms control agreements in place. While Russia will adhere to uh, the limitations, there are no verification mechanisms, which means here's in the United States, People will fear the unknown because there are no inspectors in Russia. We will fear that Russia is cheating at a time when Russia is deploying new weapon systems uh, designed, designed to defeat uh, American missile defense systems. The Sarmat heavy ICBM, the avant-garde hypersonic missile uh, are all active right now and no inspectors are in. So we fear. This means the United States will respond with an arms race of its own. And when the treaty expires in 2026, as it will, without any replacement treaty, because nobody's talking, um, we will be in an arms race that could very well lead to the death of everybody watching this seminar today. Um, so that's where we're at, ladies and gentlemen, a year in, um, and the world is seeing risks and threats unlike any that could have been imagined a year ago today. Um, who knows where we'll be in a year's time, hopefully able to have a seminar about uh, Ukraine two years on but maybe not. Yeah, I would just say that uh, the Munich Security Conference reminds me of um, the captain of the Titanic uh, gathering his staff together to plan their uh, disembarkation in New York after striking the iceberg. Um, it, everything they talked about in this conference, none of it's going to happen. None of it's going to happen. They can't even get on the same page. Zelensky begs for speed, speed, speed. Why? He knows. He knows that, that he's, it's over. Uh, meanwhile, the West, understanding that they can't give him speed, says this is going to be a long, protracted conflict. But it isn't. Uh, yeah, I don't say there was glee in my heart, but I will say this with firm conviction. I know there's a lot of people out there that aren't going to like this. I don't care. Russia needs to win this war and win this war now. The sooner Russia wins this conflict, the better it is off for the people of Ukraine, for the people of Russia, the people of the world. Russia does not want to extend this conflict. They did not want to start this conflict. But now that they're in this conflict, they must win this conflict. And they have to win it very soon. And when I say very soon, I'm talking about this summer, early fall. And I believe Russia is on course to do that. Um, it's the United States, it's Europe that protracts this conflict, keeps it going longer, slaughtering hundreds of thousands of people in the process, destroying an entire nation. For all those people out there, who put the Ukrainian flag up on your social media, um, you don't care about Ukraine. And the reason why I say you don't care about Ukraine is because you're silent in the destruction of Ukraine. Ukraine will not exist 
as a modern nation state when this conflict is done. And it's solely because of the United States, Europe, and you who put the Ukrainian flag on your social media. If you would stand up for what's right, maybe this conflict wouldn't have happened to begin with. But we've all been silently complicit in the aggression carried out by NATO over the years, expanding right up to the Russian border, bringing missile defense up, up um, having to withdraw the United States from a ballistic missile defense treaty to do this, and then disregarding arms control, using arms control as a mechanism to impose our strategic will on Russia. And as was alluded to uh, by Joe, this is a war of regime change. People need to understand that. Russia is not fighting a war of aggression. They're fighting a conflict of existential survival in the face of a policy that specifically is designed to destroy them. For anybody out there, if you live in a nation where other nations were saying, we seek to destroy you, what would you do? How would you respond? And I'll answer this way. No one here would respond with the level of maturity that Russia has responded with. Russia is the business of escalation management. If this was the United States on the receiving end, we'd be at nuclear war already. No doubt about it. But Russia has behaved rationally, patiently, responsibly, and now, according to Vladimir Putin, decisively. History is on the side of Russia, not on the side of anybody else in this conflict. And I know that's not an anti-war statement, and I apologize to anybody I might have insulted by that. But, you know, this war is real. It's here. And the best way to bring about the dire consequences and bring about the termination of the dire consequences of this conflict is to bring this conflict to an end. And people keep saying there needs to be a negotiated settlement. How can Russia ever negotiate with the West again? How can they ever negotiate with the West again? The West has violated every agreement they've ever entered to from an arms control agreement to the peace negotiations. Russia was ready to sign a peace treaty on 1 April. They had a negotiating team in Istanbul ready to sit down and finalize a treaty. And the United States and NATO pulled the plug. Why? Because they don't want peace with Russia. They want war with Russia. They want this war because they believe this war will weaken Russia and it has backfired. Russia is stronger now than they have ever been at, at any time recently. And that is the exact opposite direction we wanted this to go. So um, that's, that's where I stand. But, uh, you know, here, here's, here's my, 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 my take on, first of all, Russia is going to win. That just, people can debate me all they want, but I'm just telling you right now, I'm a military guy. I've been running numbers my entire life and um, the numbers don't lie. Um, now, here's, here's the irony. There's a lot of people take umbrage at that because they say, well, that's a pro-war stance. I don't know. Let me, let's, let's pull back for a second. How many people out there think that NATO is a corrupt organization, that NATO should be, should, should be done away with? And I would imagine most people say, I do. Okay. Uh, one of the consequences of this conflict may very well be the dissolution of NATO because it's been exposed as an empty structure, an empty suit, a paper tiger the price tag that will be attached to any NATO effort to expand, to respond to a victorious Russia is prohibitively high, especially in the aftermath of sanctions that have backfired and destroyed a European economy. How many people out there say we're against the, the hegemony of the dollar? I think there's a lot of people out there say petrodollar, hegemony of the dollar is a bad thing, and they would like to see the dismantlement of that. Well, gosh, that's sort of one of the byproducts of this conflict as well. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Everything the anti-imperialism movement claims they support is happening now, not because Russia wanted it to happen, but because of the conflict that the United States and Europe has committed to, and the byproduct of which is the dismantlement, the, dis the, the discrediting of NATO, the discrediting of the dollar. I think the world is sitting there going, why should we buy into an international reserve currency that the United States can steal anytime they want. Uh, China's sitting there looking at it going, nope, that ain't going to happen. What's happened now because the dollar has lost, people have lost confidence? Saudi Arabia is selling oil using national currencies, not the dollar. China is doing business in their currency. India is doing business. The, the dollar is falling apart. Um, the G7, you know, that wonderful group of the seven most influential economies in the world, which is little more than the economic extension of NATO, which is nothing more than the foreign extension of American uh, imperial power. Um, 
it's, it's collapsing because of the seven nations on it. Most of them have suffered tremendous economic consequences because of these sanctions. You know what is stepping into the void? Something called BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, expanding to Argentina, Turkey, Egypt, others are, everybody's flocking in to join BRICS. BRICS is the anti-dollar hegemony movement. BRICS is about what everybody who is in favor of a better world, meaning a multipolar world, a world that deviates from the American singularity. BRICS is what that's about. And look at the, the second letter, Russia, R. It's because of what is happening now, because of the leadership position Russia has taken in opposing the dollar, in opposing American global hegemony, that BRICS is becoming very, now yes, China plays a very important role because of their, the size of their economy. But the point I'm trying to make is um, for the anti-war movement, the anti-imperialist movement, to get all caught up in, you know, well, this is a war. We can't support any because Russia invaded Ukraine. Well, first of all, Russia didn't invade Ukraine. Russia was attacked by NATO. Russia was attacked by Ukraine. Uh, I mean, you consider that was Russian tanks that went in. Learn history, gentlemen, ladies. Also learn international law. Understand what Article 51 is. Understand what the notion of preemptive collective self-defense is. I'm not going to, you know, sit here and waste time explaining it to you. You can Google it. But if you think this was a unprovoked act of aggression by Russia, then we really probably have nothing more to talk about because we're beyond that. We are into the point where Russia is responding to NATO aggression, American aggression, European aggression, and they're responding in a way that, frankly speaking, is accomplishing much of which the anti-imperial group says they want it accomplished. So I would imagine you guys would actually be in favor of a Russian victory because it's actually providing a shortcut to get to where you always claimed you wanted to go to begin with. Russia didn't invade Ukraine with the standard military invasion. There was no shock and awe. There was no steamroller. They came in with what's called a special military operation. It was very soft. It was very light. It was designed to uh, limit uh, civilian infrastructure damage and civilian casualties. The purpose of the Russian action uh, was to get Ukraine to go to a negotiating table to accomplish that which Russia tried to accomplish through diplomacy prior to the invasion. That is a termination of war, Ukraine not joining NATO, Donbass being independent, Crimea being Russia, but everything else is okay. Um, and they almost succeeded. They failed because NATO pulled the plug and then NATO decided to inject tens of billions of dollars of military assistance, forcing this conflict into a new phase. Now, before that stuff was when, when Ukraine withdrew from the peace process, which, by the way, the head of Ukrainian intelligence says was a sham also, that Ukraine never intended to have a peace, that Russia once again was led by the nose, believing that there could be a diplomatic solution, only to find that the rug had pulled out from it at the end. Russia went into basically what's called the meat grinder phase, where they sought to liberate Lugansk and Donetsk territories. Very bloody phase beginning in May. Um, Bakhmut, everybody's talking about the Battle of Bakhmut. It began in May. Um, the process of grinding down the Ukrainians. And the Russians were enjoying some success, but Russia started this conflict, remember, it's supposed to be a quick conflict, with a limited number of troops. And now they were facing an extended front, insufficient forces. But Putin didn't want to mobilize because he couldn't. A lot of people don't understand the political domestic problems Putin had. One, there was concern that sanctions would be far more effective than they turned out to be. In fact, uh, Putin's advisors, according to Putin himself, were saying that Russia could have economic contraction by up to 25 percent. It turned out to be 2 percent. Um, but Putin didn't know that. So he is fearful of what the impact of sanctions will be, what the social implications of that would be when people start to feel the pinch, um, you know, political discontent. And so he didn't want to add on to that mobilization because mobilization was going to be a big deal. Again, people don't understand in the way the Russians feel about this conflict, many Russian people are against this war because this is not a war against Nazi Germany. This is not a war against you know a, a nation that invaded. This is a war against brother Slavs. And this war is deeply disturbing to so many Russians. Uh, and so Putin would have a hard time saying, we're gonna mobilize to go to war against Ukraine. So there's a slow roll taking place. And in the midst of the slow roll, the Ukrainians take tens of billions of dollars and launch a counterattack that's very successful. They push Russia out of Kharkov, they push them out of the right side of Kherson. Now Russia has to respond. 
But now by doing that, by transforming the Ukrainian military into a NATO military, Putin is now liberated politically. One, he recognizes the sanctions aren't biting. Two, he realizes he can transform this war into in, in discussing it away from a conflict with Ukraine against a conflict against NATO that's trying to destroy. So my point is, we are in a totally different place psychologically right now than we were at the beginning. Russia is a nation mobilized for war. Anybody who wants to understand what that means, read Rick Atkinson's trilogy on the U.S. Army in World War II. And, to, and, and, and watch as he takes you from an army of draftees that really didn't want to fight Nazi Germany, didn't want to go away from their homes, into an army of killers by 1943 who realized the only way they could go home is through Nazi Germany. Russia right now has an army of killers, people who are trained, equipped, they've experienced war, and they know the only way this war ends is to go straight through the Ukrainians. This is a war of numbers now, not a war of anything else. Russia has mobilized 300,000 reservists, probably another 200,000 volunteers, in addition to the 180,000 they had online. You do the math. Ukraine started with a military of 700,000. They've lost up to 300,000 dead, another 300,000 wounded. They've mobilized some. They have around 300,000 troops on the line. Ukraine is suffering a mobilization crisis for them to mug people on the street, to drag them to war. Russia is still getting volunteers by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Russia supports this war. Ukrainian, many Ukrainians don't. Uh, Russia's defense industry is geared up producing everything they need for this conflict. Ukraine's running out of ammunition, being forced to take tanks out of storage that won't start. That won't start. Um, Russia has hundreds of aircraft ready. Ukraine is begging for aircraft that they're never going to get. Um, the bottom line is Ukraine's burn rate on the battlefield is criminally high. And I, I say that what the Russians are killing them by the hundreds every day. Russia's losing a significant number of troops too, but nothing nearly that amount. But Ukraine's burn rate is high, their replenishment rate is low. That's basic math, ladies and gentlemen. The longer this battle goes, Ukraine's combat capabilities drop. Russia, on the other hand, has a high um, replenishment rate, a low burn rate, they're getting stronger. This war is, uh, is, is I mean, there's this, I'll bring up a Game of Thrones, uh, I won't use the language, but a Game of Thrones reference. Uh, famous scene or infamous scene when uh, the Lannister infantrymen are waiting to be to attacked by the Dothraki or charging in with the dragons. And the guy says, we're about to get swamped. That's Ukraine with Russia coming in right now. This war militarily um, is, is, it's all over, but the killing. That's a, just a sad statement of fact. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know where else you want me to go with this, Joe, but um, that's, that's where we're at. At a very minimum, gets arms control back on the agenda because it's not on the agenda right now. It's been taken off the agenda by the United States. Now, Russia is saying we don't have anything to do about that. And again, I don't want to be alarmist here, ladies and gentlemen. But if you look at the history of U.S. Uh, relations with Russia or the Soviet Union, um, we came this close on multiple occasions for it all being over. And, and when nuclear war happens, it's, it's all over. Um, all it takes is one mistake, one error of judgment, one miscalculation, and the world ends. And arms control is the vehicle that helps cork the genie's bottle to keep the genie from coming out. And then once we have arms control in place, a process that's based on trust and et cetera, we begin to make the genie disappear altogether. But first things first. We need arms control to prevent an arms race that leads to incalculable consequences. And we can't do that unless we get everybody involved. And, it's, and, and here's the key about getting everybody involved, too. The, thing, the biggest thing that's stopping arms control from happening in America today is Russophobia, the fear of Russia. And that fear is derived from ignorance. And we need to find a way to cut through that ignorance. I'm not asking everybody to go out there and sign I love Putin posters. Not at all. What I'm asking people to do is maybe come to a recognition that the Russian people want to live as much as we want to live. That the Russian people love people as much as we love people. That they're humans just like we are humans. And that we have to find a way to make common cause with them so that we, our two nations can talk with one another to begin the process of reducing the possibility of nuclear annihilation. All these other things that people want to accomplish, which I respect, none of that can be accomplished if the world comes to an end in a nuclear holocaust. So that, that's where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm focused on trying to bring arms control to the forefront of, um, 
of, of, of you know, both nations' policies, um, but I need help. And uh, I need help, not just from people who look like me and have my same background. I need help from the people who are going to pay the price if all this goes bad. So, Margaret, I'm reaching out to you. Joe, I'm reaching out to you. And I'm reaching out to everybody who's listening in. I think together we can, we can do some good.